Hey everybody, this is Ian Palmquist with Equality Federation. I'll be your moderator today for Transgender Disenfranchisement, a webinar on voter ideas laws. Uh, we are really excited at Equality Federation to partner with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force uh, to help get this really important information out to you. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our format, we are going to hear from our presenters first, and then we will have time for uh, question and answer at the end. Um, and we will be making a recording of this as well as some materials available online after the session. We have a great group today. Um, Patrick Paschal is the Senior Policy Counsel at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. <laughs> And he works uh, on the task force's federal administrative agency work, as well as the White House, and provides technical assistance in policy drafting and analysis to national, state, and local coalition partners on regulatory policy affecting the LGBT community. Um, Patrick's a proud member and union delegate for SEIU Local 1199, and was also elected in 2013 to serve his community as a member of the city council in Hyattsville, Maryland. And uh, we also have with us Kristen French, the Holly Law Fellow at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force this summer, who has been doing a lot of research to pull this together for all of you. Um, she is a rising 3L at William and Mary Law School in Williamsburg, Virginia, where she became interested in voting rights law after studying election law and participating in the Black Law Students Association. We have several goals today. Uh, first, to understand barriers to voting that transgender people face, uh, to arm state-based advocates like you with the information needed to ensure that transgender voters have access to the franchise, know what their voting rights are, know how to obtain updated IDs when they need them, um, and also to ensure that poll workers are trained on how to process transgender voters with dignity and equal access. So we really want to work to make sure that we don't just have the kind of policies that we need, but also that they're being implemented in a way that meets the needs of the community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen to start us off. Hi, everyone. This is Kristen. Uh, we're going to start off the webinar today by talking about uh, some of the obstacles that trans folks face when trying to vote. Uh, in 2012, the Williams Institute did a report on the potential impact of voter ID laws on trans voters, and these are some of their findings. 88,000 trans voters were eligible to vote in the 2012 general election in the nine states that had strict voter ID laws at that time. Up to 25,000 of these voters might have been disenfranchised by these laws. And trans folks of color, youth, students, those with low incomes, and those with disabilities were even more likely to be disenfranchised because of these strict ID laws. And for this, uh, for this report, the Williams Institute looked at data from the National Transgender Discrimination Survey on trans folks without IDs in each state. Then they compared these survey participant numbers with the numbers of the populations in each state. And that's where they came up with the estimates that you can see here. And as you can see, 124,000 trans voters might not have any updated IDs or records at all. And 183,000 might be without updated driver's license and as many is 338,000 trans voters might not have updated U.S. passports. And as you'll see in this webinar, not having updated ID can make it really hard for these folks to get to vote. One more reason that it's hard for trans folks to access updated IDs is because requirements really vary a lot from state to state, and they can be expensive and difficult. And not only that, but among federal agencies, too, requirements really vary. Uh, the cost of getting or updating a passport can even be prohibitive for some members of the trans community, uh, which is disproportionately impacted by poverty. So these are some stats on trans voting. Uh, as you can see, trans folks are actually more likely to be registered to vote than the general population. But unfortunately, despite this, they still face such high levels of discrimination in other areas, like unequal treatment, harassment, and even assault in voting that it can deter their participation if they have access to, up to updated IDs or even if they're registered. Um, and as you can see, like I said, they're even more likely to be registered at a rate of 92.5% of trans Americans versus 71% of the general population. So this is encouraging, but obviously there are still things that are keeping them from being able to fully participate in their right, and we'll talk about that further. 
the Williams Institute also estimates uh, that up to 24,000 trans voters might be disenfranchised in the upcoming election in 2014 in the states that you see listed here. So clearly this is an ongoing problem. Uh, it's not something that was rectified after the 2012 general election. And we'll see that a lot of problems, particularly in the states that you see here. So not only is it harder for trans uh, voters to access the polls, but they also face a lot of discrimination across the board in different areas of their life, particularly in a lot of the areas that we have up here, such as homelessness and poverty. And we're going to go into greater detail in these areas and the discrimination they face uh, right now. So transgender people are disproportionately impacted by homelessness and poverty. A lot of us probably already know this. They're four times more likely to live in extreme poverty and twice as likely to be currently homeless than the general population. 15% have a household income of less than 10,000 a year, and this rate reaches as high as 23% for multiracial trans folks. Sadly, 11% say they've been evicted simply because of their transgender gender identity. Not only is this discrimination unfair, of course, but being homeless or impoverished can even really increase the, the risk of disenfranchisement. Lack, uh, lacking a fixed address, moving around a lot, or being homeless really make an individual less likely to be registered to vote in the right precinct. They might be aware, unaware of the correct polling places, and a lot of homeless folks are even unaware that they have the right to vote at all, which of course they do. Trans people also face really high levels of discrimination in the criminal justice system, which as you can see here, we call the criminal injustice system. They're disproportionately targeted by the police, and as a result, almost half are afraid to seek police assistance when they need help. Uh, it's easy to see why when 7% of trans folks have been held in a jail cell only because of police bias against their gender identity or expression. This number is up to six times higher for trans people of color. Uh, not only this, but when they've been to jail or prison, they report really high rates of physical and sexual assault. And not only is this, like I said, discrimination is unfair, but it also has a really severe impact on the right to vote. In fact, almost 6 million Americans are unable to vote because of a felony conviction. And because law enforcement targets LGBT people at higher rates, a lot of those disenfranchised are LGBT identified. And trans folks also face high rates of discrimination when they try to access public accommodations, like going out to eat at a restaurant or staying at a hotel. More than half say that they've been harassed or disrespected when trying to access these public accommodations. And trans people even report harassment, disrespect, and physical assault when they're trying to work with government officials, judges, or courts. So it makes, it's pretty obvious that because of this discrimination, trans people might be uh, deterred from attempting to even update their IDs because they fear harassment and even physical assault. And this obviously really serves as a barrier to them being able to vote in full force. Unfortunately, trans folks are much more likely, in part because of all this discrimination, to commit suicide than the general population. As you can see here, the rate is really staggering. And this rate only increases when they face additional discrimination in all the areas that you see here, like bullying or losing a job due to bias. Trans people also face a lot of discrimination in healthcare. They're often refused care. They, uh, half the time they have to deal with uninformed doctors who don't even know how to treat a trans patient. And they suffer from very high rates of HIV, four times the national average. Because of social marginalization and discrimination, trans people are particularly vulnerable in many areas, including healthcare. And then this just makes it even more important that for them to get to right, access their right to vote to protect these interests that are so endangered. Now, people who express a trans identity early on in life, in grades K through 12, face really high levels of discrimination and harassment. And you can see some of the stats we're putting up here about the different horrible experiences they have in grade school when they come out as trans. Uh, some even face harassment so severe that they're forced to leave school. And obviously, this has really negative impacts on them later in life in areas across the board, from lower incomes to which just increases uh, the likelihood that they'll be disenfranchised later in life. A full 9 out of 10 trans people exp it report experiencing harassment, mistreatment, and discrimination at work. Almost half say that they were either not hired, fired, or denied a promotion because of their gender identity. And many felt compelled as a result, not surprisingly, to try to take steps to avoid this discrimination. So they would hide their gender identity or delay their transition, and they were forced to do this to try to avoid the discrimination. 
and over 16% were forced to work in the underground economy by doing things like selling drugs or doing sex work just to try to survive. Now it's very common for trans voters to have inconsistencies between the way they appear and the name, photo, or gender marker on their IDs. Many trans folks have not been able to update all their IDs or records, as we talked about briefly earlier, and some have not been able to update any of their IDs or records. Uh, and this can make it really hard for them to vote and can lead to harassment, it can lead to them being asked to leave an establishment, or even being assaulted just for presenting an ID that doesn't match their gender identity or expression for people who uh, are not, don't have an awareness of uh, what this means. So next up we're going to talk a little bit, by the way, this is Patrick Shaw from the Task Force speaking. Um, next we're going to talk a little bit about how voter ID laws impact transgender people. So there are two important ways that voter ID laws have a direct impact on transgender people. One is uh, these requirements create additional barriers for anyone who has difficulty obtaining the required form of ID. And as Kristen just noted, there are all kinds of barriers that exist for trans folks in accessing IDs. The second way is that the new laws increase the likelihood that transgender voters will encounter confusion, bias, or discrimination because of the scrutiny of their ID documents and their gender markers at the polling place or even themselves be confused about what the voter ID requirements are and whether they have the ability to meet them. Because of these news law, new laws, some states now require photo identification in order to vote. And this includes driver's licenses and passports, military IDs, state employee, and state employee ID cards. Some states allow uh, student photo IDs. Some states actually don't accept passports because you don't have an address in the passport. So, it's fascinating how these different disparate voter ID laws in the various states um, have different standards uh, that are inconsistently applied even within the state uh, and certainly inconsistent across the country. So voters who do not present proper ID in these states, um, they may face a, a number of barriers. They may be asked to sign an affidavit confirming their identity. Uh, they may be given a provisional ballot and required to prove their identity within a few days, usually by visiting an election office judge um, in order for their vote to count. So, you know, these types of barriers make it more difficult for a trans person to even cast a ballot, or if they are casting a ballot, more difficult for, for their vote to actually count. Be aware that the types of ID that are, that are accepted, as I mentioned earlier, vary by state from state to state. Some accept passports, some accept student ID, uh, some don't. And so it really depends on what your state's laws are, and, uh, and you need to look into that. Um, when you're trying to educate trans folks in your state about their right to vote. Social security cards and birth certificates are not accepted in any of the states that require a photo ID in order to vote because, of course, although they are records of your uh, citizenship or your, your right to vote uh, in the jurisdiction, they aren't photo identification, uh, neither social security or birth certificate. So in those states, those aren't acceptable. Uh, many states don't require a photo ID, but they request a photo ID. Um, and so, you know, a trans person or any other person may go to the polling place, be asked for a photo ID. When they say they don't have a photo ID, uh, then in those cases, they can provide a, a birth certificate, a social security card, a utility bill, or anything else that has their name and address that is consistent with the name and address that's listed in the voter registration file. Uh, unfortunately, though, just being asked for a photo ID uh, is a barrier for a lot of folks, especially if you know that you don't have the ID that matches your presentation or your name uh, or the information that is listed inside the voter registration record. And also, some states uh, require no ID at all, and other states require a non-photo ID um, in the first place. They won't even ask for photo ID. They just say, do you have a utility bill or do you have a voter, voter registration card? So you need to check your state's law. Uh, and of course, we're happy to work with you on that if you wanted to do some trans voter ID specific messaging. So um, the type of ID necessary, uh, as we said, depends on what state you're in. Um, and in several states that have these strict new photo ID uh, laws, the laws have, are being challenged both in the courts uh, and by the Justice Department. We know, uh, for example, that a number of laws that were supposed to take effect in 2012 ended up not taking effect in 2012, uh, but are now on the books and in effect. Um, so you should assume that the laws will be in effect on Election Day because it's better to have a correct ID and not need it 
than to need a correct ID and not have it. So you know, we encourage uh, you know we encourage you to reach out to trans folks in your state uh, and 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 prepare for the worst uh, and prepare for the strictest photo ID requirement. Regardless of the photo ID requirement, the name and address on the ID you use needs to match your voter registration record. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there will be questions about whether or not you're actually an eligible voter in that particular jurisdiction. In photo ID states, if you do not have a photo ID that matches your registration, you might be given a provisional ballot. In fact, you have a legal right in all these states to cast a provisional ballot, um, uh, and then each state has a different requirement on what it takes for that provisional ballot. So though transgender voters may not be specifically targeted by new uh, voter ID laws, they're certainly impacted by them. Um, many trans people are unable to obtain updated photo identification. Uh, and you know, under these laws, uh, poll workers really do have broad discretion to deny voters access to the polls if they believe the voter, even if they believe incorrectly, that the voter is trying to uh, fraudulently vote or doesn't meet the, the requirements for voting. And so um, that's an important thing uh, to remember as you talk to uh, folks in your state about how to prepare to vote. And, and just folks need to know that trans folks are disproportionately targeted and affected by this because the discretion lies with whomever it is that they encounter when they go to the, the polls. So voters may be prevented from casting a regular ballot for three main reasons, the gender, or other discrepancies on their ID that might conflict with either their uh, their various forms of ID, uh, or it might conflict with the information on the voter registration roll. Second reason is unfair suspicion of discrimination uh, based on appearance, and then the third is a lack of required ID. So we'll go into these in a little bit more detail. Uh, because of varying state policies and laws, uh, many trans folks are just flat out unable to access an updated driver's license or other form of ID that reflects their gender identity. Uh, in some states, they require, uh, in order to get an updated name or gender marker on an ID, that you have a letter from a physician indicating that you're undergoing a gender transition, uh, which is a relatively easy standard for folks to, to, to achieve. Of course, that is all wrapped up in access to healthcare and those sorts of things, um, but it's a relatively low barrier compared to other states. Some states won't allow you to update your driver's license unless if you have had some form of surgery that they deem the necessary surgery or set of surgeries for you to qualify. And in some states, it's flat out impossible to update the gender marker on a driver's license um, uh, or on a birth certificate or any of those other uh, documents that, that might be used. Um, another discrepancy is that the ID may not list the name or gender that is consistent with the way that the voter currently presents themselves. So for example, uh, you know, a transgender voter might present uh, and uh, consistent with their gender identity, but their photo ID still reflects their birth sex uh, or, um, or the name that they went by before they transitioned. None of these things, of course, make a person's ID invalid or insufficient to establish voter, ID, uh, voter eligibility, but it does create confusion at the polling place. Because of ignorance and bias regarding transgender people or flat out misunderstanding the law, poll workers often will believe that a person's ID is invalid or suspicious um, and try to prevent them from voting uh, on suspicion of voter fraud. So while bringing multiple forms of ID is what we often recommend because it is uh, it can be helpful for resolving any questions, especially if you're not sure which name is listed in the voter registration role, if a person has multiple forms of ID uh, with different names or just different gender designations on their different forms of ID, it might actually add to the confusion uh, that the poll worker experiences and determining whether or not this particular voter is eligible to vote. Here's a good example uh, from the news just this year. So Jordan Hansen, a transgender woman, uh, fears she'll be disenfranchised in the upcoming election cycle. She's a, a resident of Kansas. She's older than 18. She's registered to vote. She has an official government-issued ID, but unfortunately she's been unable to update that photo ID uh, in, in terms of the sex field. So it still is listed as M, even though she identifies as a woman. Uh, she's tried to change her driver's license, uh, but as we know, every state has different policies for changing a driver's license. This particular state said that she had to go get her birth certificate changed first. So she goes to the Department of Vital Records, and they say it's impossible to change your birth certificate in this state because of a Supreme Court case. 
So she is unsure what's going to happen when she goes to the polling place because while poll workers are instructed not to consider sex in assessing photo ID, transgender voters have experienced problems with having to educate poll workers about sex discrepancies on their ID and even having to explain to them what transgender means. So, uh, and we'll share these slides with folk, with uh, participants in the webinar. We have your email addresses. So we'll, we'll be sure and share this set of slides and the other resources. And you can see at the bottom there is a link to this particular story. But this is a great example of the very kind of fear that trans folks uh, may have when uh, attempting to access the polls and selection system. The second reason was lack of required ID. While most people take having photo ID for granted, many people, especially those with low incomes or limited access to transportation or other resource limitations, just flat out don't have access to ID. And this is especially true for elders, uh, for uh, folks with low income, people of color. Uh, and, and we see that those are often uh, the, the plaintiffs highlighted in a lot of these litigation cases in states that have new strict photo ID laws. Uh, and obtaining the required ID can be a, a significant financial and logistical hurdle for, for a lot of folks. Because of high rates of poverty and unemployment, discrimination in general facing transgender people, uh, and you know the, some of the numbers that Kristen talked about earlier around uh, experiencing violence and harassment when speaking to government officials, um, and the fear of disrespect and discrimination when applying for photo ID, it's not um, it's not surprising that transgender people are disproportionately unlikely to have the photo ID they need in order to, in order to vote. Of course, in general, any person who's at least 18, year old, 18 years old is a citizen and meets the resident requirements of their state can vote. And this is true regardless of their sex, race, national origin, disability status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Uh, and just to be extremely clear, in no state is being transgender or gender nonconforming uh, a sufficient reason to deny someone access to Voting while homeless or voting without a fixed address. Many people wrongly believe that homeless people cannot vote. Of course, we know that our, our entire system is based on uh, allowing folks to vote based on where they live. And so if you lack a fixed address, I think many folks believe that, um, that homeless folks or those without a fixed address don't have, don't have a legal right to the polls. It's just not true. Um, most states allow a shelter address or a description of a general location at which the individual usually spends the night, or even a map to be recorded uh, as you know, sufficient information for determining where, which precinct they're in and, and where to mail election information. So, um, you, so you should check with your local elections office to confirm what may be used as an address, especially as we know that homelessness disproportionately affects the transgender community. Uh, and, and you know, even so, um, arming people with the knowledge and the legal requirements in that state, uh, it, homeless people often will still experience additional barriers. And so it's important to make sure they know uh, what their legal rights are to vote. And uh, you can go to 866-OurVote.org and click on your state to get more information. And finally, in this section, we'll talk about fel felony convictions and voting. As Kristen mentioned earlier, 5.85 million Americans have lost their right to vote because of felony convictions. And in some states, uh, it, you, in some states, you can regain the right to vote after you have served your time and you have finished your parole period. Um, you may petition to have your voting rights restored and re-register and vote. Uh, that's not in every state. Uh, and I believe in 11 states, it is impossible to receive back your voting rights. So in a society where law enforcement disproportionately targets transgender people for enforcement of, uh, you know, uh, possessing a condom uh, as sort of was often called walking while trans, um, and uh, as trans folks are disproportionately victims of employment discrimination and disproportionately low income, uh, they're forced to work uh, in the underground economy. As law enforcement targets transgender folks for law enforcement, uh, the rate of felony convictions is higher, and then of course disenfranchisement them as a result of that. You can check for um, what your state's policies are at the website. Hey everyone, this is Kristen again, and we're going to uh, transition into the next section and show you a couple of fact sheets that we've made up. All right, so uh, this is a fact sheet that we put together on why transgender people should care about voting, and obviously um, we knew it would be a little hard to read on in this format, so we're going to make it available to you shortly on our website, and we'll send out these slides to you. Um, this is a good resource going forward. It talks about a lot of what we're talking about now. As you can see, 
the different um, areas of discrimination that trans folks face in their day-to-day -day life and why it is therefore so important for them to exercise the right that they have to vote to protect their interests in all these areas. And uh, this is a transgender voter fact sheet that will also be made available to you on our website and we'll send out to you. You can use it as a resource going forward uh, to remind yourself of what we talked about or to use it to educate others uh, of what their rights are and what issues are at stake. So now that we've talked a lot about the obstacles that trans folks face in everyday life and in trying to vote, here's what you guys can all do to help. Uh, you can help to educate trans folks about their voting rights and how they can get updated IDs. And you can help to change the actual policies on how poll workers are trained so that they are trained on how to process trans voter, uh, transgender voters with dignity and with respect because a lot of times they don't cover that at all in poll worker training. And as we can see, that really leads to a lot of discrimination that trans voters have to face in trying to exercise their rights. So here are seven things that every trans per transgender uh, person should do now so they can make sure that they can vote in the November 2014 election. And we'll go on to talk about them in greater detail shortly, but feel free to take some time and look at the seven important steps. All right, so what you're looking at here is NCTEs, the National Center for Transgender Equality's Voting While Trans Checklist. This is a great resource for trans voters to make sure they know what to do not only before Election Day, but on Election Day, so that they'll make sure they get to exercise their right to vote and have their vote counted. And as you can see, it directs you to go to canivote.org to make sure that you're registered to vote or to update your registration as need be. And you can even go there to register for the first time. And you can go to 866rvote.org to see what ID is required in your state so you don't have any surprises when you show up on election day. And you can find this checklist at votingwelltrans.org and that way you can print it out and take it with you on election day so you can feel empowered that you know what your rights are and you know what process you'll have to go through and you hopefully won't have any surprises on election day. Uh, this resource is also from NCTE. It provides information for poll workers and election officials about how to process trans voters with dignity and with respect. You can also find this on votingwelltrans.org, and you can see what rights uh, that trans voters are entitled to when they go to vote. And they can also uh, print this out and take it with them and feel empowered that they know what their rights are. And then if a poll worker isn't trained on how to uh, treat a transgender voter with dignity and respect, then they can feel empowered to show them this and know that hopefully their, uh, their rights will be respected and they won't have to face additional discrimination when they just try to go and vote. Now, some states offer early voting, and this is a great way to make sure that you don't run into any problems with your ID or any other problems you might face on Election Day. And if you do run into issues and you're voting early, at least you have time to address them before Election Day, and hopefully you will be disenfranchised. Uh, now, early voting times really vary by state, but again, you can see the address here. You can go to 866rvote.org or your state or county elections office website, and you can find out if early voting is available in your state. And if so, how and when you can go about doing that. And we recommend that as a great option. And here are a list of states that offer early voting. Feel free to take a minute and look to see if your state is listed here and if you can choose to vote early should you choose to go that route. And now absentee voting is another option uh, that's an alternative to the traditional voting in person on election day. And there's two different types of absentee vote voting. The first is no excuse absentee voting, and this lets anyone vote absentee for any reason. And other states uh, don't have that, and they require voters to give a reason why they can't be in person voting on election day. And in these states that require a reason, rules really vary about what excuses are accepted. Uh, so you should, you should look up uh, what your state offers and uh, what excuses will accept if you choose to go this route. Now, D.C. and 27 states allow no excuse absentee voting, so it is available in a lot of the states. And if you live in one of these states and you want to exercise this option, we recommend you try to vote by absentee ballot as early as possible. This way, you can make sure you have time to work out any ID issues or anything else that may arise and make sure that your vote gets in on time and is counted. And once again, uh, we direct you to 866rvote.org um, or your state elections website. You can find out if your state offers this option. Um, note that if you... If your state has both early voting and absentee voting, then you should feel free to use whichever option you think is more comfortable or more convenient for you. They're both good alternatives to in-person voting 
I think you're more comfortable with that. And here are a list of states that offer no excuse absentee voting. So take some time and let's just see if your state is listed so you'll know what your options are. Oh, interestingly, uh, we found out that Washington and Oregon actually require their residents to vote by mail. So if you live in either Washington or Oregon, you should be prepared to vote this way before Election Day. And now, if a poll worker decides, Patrick touched on this briefly earlier, if a poll worker decides that you are ineligible to vote in their opinion, they might issue you what's called this provisional ballot. It's really important to remember that this is not an acceptable alternative to a regular ballot, because studies have shown that provisional ballots often don't actually get counted. So you might leave feeling like you voted when, in fact, your vote won't end up counting. If you're eligible to vote, you deserve to vote by regular ballot. If you have to vote by provisional ballot, you generally, as Patrick said before, have to return to election officials within a few days and prove your identity or your vote will be, won't be counted. So make sure if you do have to vote this way that before you leave, you talk to election officials and find out what you're required to do so you can try to comply with it and make sure that, you know, that your vote is counted. And obviously, because of a lot of obstacles we talked about to accessing updated IDs, trans voters are more likely to be disenfranchised when they face discrimination at the polls and are forced to vote via provisional ballot. Now, if you do face problems trying to vote on Election Day, it's good to know that there is some recourse you can take. You can call the Nationwide Election Protection Hotline at 1-866-R-VOTE to report the problem and to ask for help, and they'll be able to guide you through the process. If you've been turned away or made to use a provisional ballot, just call this number, report the incident, and make sure you find out what you can do so that your vote is counted. So now we're going to talk a little bit about changing policies on how to process transgender voters. Um, so we talked earlier, and, and the first half of our presentation uh, was about really how to educate transgender voters about uh, the barriers that exist and the rights that trans voters have uh, when trying to access the polling place on election day. Uh, but, you know, the other piece of this is making sure that the poll workers are adequately trained on how to process transgender voters when a transgender voter does appear. So uh, we're going to go through uh, various ID requirements in, in, in some federal law on uh, on voter ID policies and then some model policies uh, for poll workers. So the Help America Vote Act of 2002, HAVA as it's called in the DC political circles, required US citizens who are voting for the first time in a state and who registered by mail in that state to provide a photo ID uh, when they go and vote for the first time. And this led states to adopting stricter voter ID requirements in many states. 34 states have passed voter ID laws, 31 of which are enforced. And there are a couple kinds of voter, photo ID laws. There's a strict photo ID law in which voters must provide government-issued photo ID in order to have their vote, in order to cast a regular ballot, and in order to have their vote counted. And as we said earlier, this can be all kinds of different uh, ID. And almost, I think in all states, a state-issued driver's license counts. Uh, or a state-issued ID, uh, but there are varying standards on whether uh, passport counts, uh, you know, military ID, uh, student ID, those sorts of things. Of course, may, voters in those states may cast a provisional ballot, but they have to provide the required photo ID afterward in order to get your votes count. So if you don't have access to the photo ID, you cannot vote in that state, period. And of course, currently in effect, there are eight states um, that have that law. Pennsylvania had a, had a law in 2012 and it was struck down. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then of course there are photo ID states where they ask for a photo ID but it's not required to vote. You can get your vote to count by meeting other requirements uh, as we mentioned earlier like showing a utility bill or a social security card. Um, and then there are uh, states that have uh, you know, truly good policies around how to get their voters to vote, which is by not requiring a photo ID. Uh, because as we know, and studies show that uh, voter fraud is incredibly low. I read a report just yesterday that uh, out of over a billion ballots checked, only 31 were even suspicious. Uh, that, is, that is not that they were proven to be fraudulent. They were just 
So find your state on this list. Uh, on the left side, we have photo ID required. Um, and, and on the right side, we have photo ID not required. And, and you'll see that the photo ID required list on the left is longer than the eight states we listed as strict photo ID states. Uh, these are states in which, uh, for example, if you don't uh, issue, a, if you don't have a photo ID, they may require you to sign an affidavit and ca pass a provisional ballot, have an election judge later look at it. Uh, and so we considered those in the sort of required category because uh, the barriers to voting are higher, even though it's not a legal requirement to show a photo ID in order to get your vote to count. It is a requirement to show it in order to get a regular ballot on election day. And of course, on the right side are places where photo ID is not required. Uh, remember that in some of these states, where they will ask for photo ID first. And of course, poll worker confusion can lead to serious issues. Uh, if they aren't aware that photo ID is merely requested rather than required. We want to highlight uh, two uh, recent changes in strict photo ID laws. So in Pennsylvania, a strict photo ID law was signed in 2012, uh, but uh, you know a judge, a, a trial judge uh, struck it down, it was appealed, a, an appellate judge also struck it down as unconstitutional. Um, and the governor uh, of Pennsylvania said he was not gonna, going to appeal the ruling to the state's highest court. Uh, and so that photo ID law is no longer in effect in Pennsylvania, even though it is technically on the books. Uh, fun fact about the Pennsylvania case, uh, a transgender plaintiff was one of the eight or nine plaintiffs in the case that ultimately did bring down the Pennsylvania strict photo ID law. And really very interestingly, at the trial level, that, uh, that plaintiff spoke at length about the various barriers that transgender people experience uh, when accessing photo ID and employment discrimination and those sorts of things, and why that particular plaintiff was unable to get a photo ID that was updated and accurate. Uh, and that was you know, one of many, but I think a significantly uh, important contributing factor to why the strict photo ID laws were shown to be really, truly ridiculous uh, and unconstitutional. And then, of course, in Wisconsin, there was a photo ID requirement that was established in, in 2011, but earlier this year, a federal court found that the photo ID requirement violates the Constitution and the Voting Rights Act uh, and issued a permanent injunction, which is legal ease for you can't enforce this law uh, against implementation of the photo ID requirements. So the law is not in effect in Wisconsin in this election. Uh, this is a, the same list of photo ID required states, just uh, put in a different form. Uh, we thought this might be an interesting way to visualize uh, really just how much of the country is covered by states where a photo ID is, uh, is required in order to get a regular ballot uh, and really has a, a deep and serious impact on uh, voters' access to the polls. Uh, it's uh, not just a few states, it's a pretty large chunk of the country affected by this. So what can we do? We can work with uh, state, and county, and local elections workers to try and come up with policies on how to process transgender voters. Even in states where there are strict photo ID requirements, we can make sure that poll workers are aware of what the law is and what the requirements are so that transgender voters aren't uh, inaccurately denied or incorrectly denied the right to vote in elections if they actually meet the requirements. So the first couple of things we're going to go through are, are recommendations that we have uh, regardless of uh, whether you're in a strict photo ID state or a state without strict photo ID. Uh, but uh, these, are, these are things that are generally true for all poll workers. And then we'll go through some specific recommendations for photos with, for states with photo ID requirements and states without. And of course, we have these model policies written out uh, for you that we're happy to share. And we'll share that in a and an email following this presentation with copies of those policies. And we're happy to work with you and your state uh, uh, directly to put together materials specific to your state and state's laws. The gender-related appearance of a voter uh, is not relevant to their right to vote. A voter is not required in any state to dress or appear as the gender listed on their ID or as the gender that would seem to match the voter's name, uh, such as, you know, Steve being a masculine name, or Jane being a feminine name, uh, nor the gender listed on the voter registration record. Not all states have a gender listed on the voter registration record, uh, but some do. Uh, poll workers should, should treat voters as the gender that matches how they're presenting themselves. If they're unsure, uh, 
whether a person identifies as male or female, and they need to know, and only if they need to know, asking respectfully and discreetly if appropriate. So I'd like to treat you respectfully, voter, so can you please tell me if you identify yourself as male? No questions about the person's gender expression, body, or medical treatment are ever appropriate. A transgender person, and this is, of course, also what we recommend that the full training include, a transgender person may bring in multiple forms of ID, which may have different names and gender markers. They're doing this because they want to show that they are the same person who's listed in the voter registration record. It is very common for a transgender person to not have all of their IDs fully match each other. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey found that 80% of transgender folks experience this gender ID uh, and name, name and gender on ID discrepancy. A trans person may also bring in legal name change papers to prove that they have that, that they have changed their name and they should be treated the same way as others who change their name. Of course, poll workers should only respectfully confirm that the voter is the same person as listed in the voter registration record. For states without strict photo ID requirements, acquiring a photo or other ID that reflects a person's name and gender identity can be difficult or even impossible. And 40% of transgender people have been unable to acquire an updated state issued driver's license that reflects their gender, their current gender. 74% have been unable to update, have been able to update their passport issues. So to clarify, the 74%, that's three quarters of, tra three quarters of trans people have been able to successfully access uh, an updated gender marker on the passport because the federal rules for passports uh, are actually really friendly to trans folks. There's a financial barrier there, though. It costs $110 for a passport renewal, $140 for a brand new passport. 27% of transgender people report having no IDs or records that list their correct gender, and trans people of color are even less likely to have an updated ID. And of course, these are the things, they're a repetition, I think, for uh, many of the folks in the webinar, but these are the things that we actually say to poll workers uh, in the training. Uh, and then we give an example. So a voter arrives at the polls, dresses and presents herself as female, and says she's registered to vote as William Smith. She signs the voter registration record, and her signature matches the signature on file. And she presents a document that matches the voter registration record. So what is the poll worker supposed to do? Provide her with a regular ballot. Because the voter shows documents that meet all the requirements for voting, the voter is eligible for a regular ballot, and all other factors like gender-related appearance are not relevant. And, of course, the voter should be uh, referred to as ma'am, her, or Mrs. Smith because she presents herself as female. And then in states with photo ID requirements, we know that more than 25,000 trans voters have been incorrectly denied the right to vote uh, or, or were at risk to do so in the 2012 election. And poll workers mistakenly reject voters because of their appearance or gender marker is different than the poll worker might expect. So the form of ID that is required to be shown on election day may not have a gender marker or photo that appears consistent with the gender data on the voter registration record, that's okay. A transgender person may have multiple IDs and repeating the 80% statistic that we talked about earlier, just to make sure that these poll workers are really aware of what the requirements are and what the requirements are not for transgender voters. So we go through a similar example for the states with photo ID requirements in our model policy. Voter arrives and dresses and presents as female, but has an ID that has an M for male and William Smith is the name. The photo is of the voter and she's dressed and appearing as a male. And the information on the ID matches the voter registration file. What's the poll worker to do? Provide the voter with a regular ballot because the ID matches the voter registration record and the photo is of the voter. The voter is eligible for a regular ballot. All other factors are not relevant. And of course, treat her with gender pronouns that so, in this presentation, we've talked about how the gender-related appearance of a voter is not relevant to their right to vote. A transgender person may bring in multiple forms of ID, but that does not impede and should not impede their right to vote. And uh, regardless of uh, whether or not the person is up to the ballot or not, uh, the, all voters are to be, to be treated with respect and with, you know, as the gender difference. Uh, so, just as a quick review, trans folks experience intense levels of discrimination, really in every area of life. And those intense levels of discrimination have a huge impact uh, on their ability to access updated IDs. And in many cases, trans folks are flat out unable to access updated IDs. 
And as a result, strict photo ID laws, they create confusion. In many states, they disenfranchise trans voters. In many other states where they don't have strict photo ID laws, confusion among poll workers and among trans folks has the result of disenfranchisement, and it really is affecting tens of thousands of trans folks in this country. What can we do as advocates? First and foremost, we can educate trans folks about how to obtain the ID that you need to vote, know what your voting rights are, and just really to be self-advocates for making sure that your, your ballot gets counted when you go to the polls. And then, of course, we can also work with elections officials to educate poll workers really about what is respectful treatment of transgender voters, what are the laws regarding ID requirements, and, and what are the circumstances in which a, a trans person uh, you know, should and shouldn't be given a regular ID. So hopefully we've been able to really adequately cover those topics. You know, we know that there are always state-specific questions. Uh, we're happy to provide uh, all kinds of technical assistance to you and your state to look up your state's laws and, and put together uh, uh, you know, joint materials on uh, how trans voters, what the, what the laws and responsibilities are for trans voters in your states um, in order to prepare folks for, for this election cycle. And we're also, of course, happy to do the same with the model voter policies. So um, at this time, I guess, Ian, can you give folks instructions on how to submit questions and comments so that we can try and address those concerns? Yeah, thanks so much, Patrick and Kristen. Um, we do have a little time for questions. Um, there is a questions tab on your control panel. If you have questions and can uh, type them in there um, so that we don't have kind of audio problems, I'm just gonna uh, share those. And we've already got a few that have come in. Uh, the first one is from Peter in Oregon. Um, and he notes that several of the Northwest states are mail-in only and that they're seeing disenfranchisement more around mismatched signatures or unknown reasons. Um, how do you see or do you see this uh, impacting folks in those mail-in states like Oregon and Washington? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a really great point. You know, I think that um, places like Oregon and Washington where it's all mail-in, uh, you know, one of the uh, barriers that's reduced is certainly there's no photo ID requirement. And there is uh, less concern around scrutiny from poll workers for not dressing or appearing as the name listed in the voter registration role. Um, but one of the things that trans folks are going to experience in those states a lot is, you know, they're not going to know whether or not their vote was counted uh, because that all happens on the on the back end after you've submitted your your ballot, and they don't e they don't send you a, a ballot back that says, you know, or a, a letter back that says your vote was not counted because, you know, the signature didn't match. Uh, but I think what's more common for trans folks in those two states is that uh, after you change a name uh, or a gender marker, you go through a legal process of changing a name or a gender marker, uh, you have to update your driver's license and your credit cards and your you know, rent statements and all sorts of your mortgage statements, all that sort of stuff gets updated. And I think the one thing that is just most commonly overlooked in that process is updating your voter registration role. So when you send in, uh, uh, you know, a ballot, uh, when you when you receive your ballot by mail, um, you know, it might have the wrong name on it. And what trans folks are going to need to do is really be proactive about before receiving that ballot in the first place, going and updating their voter registration. Because by the time you receive the ballot and it's on the wrong name, uh, you're in the position of, of being concerned about committing voter fraud uh, by submitting the ballot under your previous name or not submitting the ballot at all. Uh, and so I think that's going to be the biggest concern for trans folks in those two states, uh, as, as specifically around when you update your name, making sure that you update your voter registration file. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, the next one is from my Federation colleague, Rowie, and she asks, has there been a discussion about having a hotline specifically for trans people encountering problems voting so we can offer live help and also collect stories about what is happening? Thanks, Rui. That's a fantastic suggestion. We talked about it in the 2012 election, uh, and um, you know, one of the thing, one of the conclusions that we came to is that the 866 uh, hour vote election protection hotline. Um, they're really great progressive folks uh, who are already um, really well known in terms of election protection, and uh, they know what the rights and responsibilities are for trans folks, and so. You know, we, what we wouldn't want to do is, is to then put the resources into having a hotline 
where we only answer trans questions and maybe the trans voter has experienced a non-trans specific voting protection issue that we don't have the expertise to answer. Uh, and so we defer to the to the really good progressive folks at 1866 Power Vote who, who, who know what the policies are and want to make sure that every eligible voter gets to have their, their ballot cast. And so we, we defer to, that, to them uh, and, and encourage voters on election day if they're having trouble to call 866 Power Vote. Great. Uh, Yuan at Empire State Pride Agenda wants to know, why would a poll worker ever need to know someone's, you know, quote, real gender? Well, uh, yeah, um, I, I think that, it, so in some states, they actually do have a gender marker in the voter registration record. Uh, it's, it's relatively rare. There aren't very many states that have that. Um, and so in those states, uh, there could be some serious questions around whether or not uh, your voter ID is consistent with the voter registration record and how do you update the voter registration record. Um, I think that in, in, you know, in the model policy uh, as it's written that we present to elected officials or um, local elections officials, uh, we uh, make it really clear that it's incredibly rare and, and likely not truly um, legitimate for the poll worker to ask a question like that. And we also say things like it is flat out disrespectful to ask about medical interventions or any medical treatments that a transgender person has experienced uh, because that is uh, irrelevant, uh, disrespectful, and offensive. And that's part of the training. Is that it's just a very basic trans one-on-one -on, -one on what you're allowed to ask and not allowed to ask. And the question really comes down to is this necessary for you to determine that this voter is eligible to vote in this election? In almost every case, that answer is going to be no. But there are a couple states where uh, they have, uh, they unfortunately have a gender marker listed on the on the voter registration form. A couple more questions. Um, first, uh, this is from uh, Gina at Equality Florida. Does trans voter discrimination fall along any sort of party lines? Like, are Democrats more frequently disenfranchised than GOP folks? You know, I wish we knew the answer to that question. Uh, unfortunately, there is a total lack of data around transgender voters and transgender voting behaviors. Um, so we don't know whether transgender people are more likely to be Republicans, Democrats, or independents. Um, we uh, also don't know whether the folks that are perpetrating uh, discrimination uh, against trans folks are Democrats, Republicans, or independents. Uh, the, we do know that uh, in the 2012 election, uh, an organization that I don't believe had a partisan affiliation called True the Vote uh, was an organization dedicated to eradicating voter fraud. It was, um, it, you know, as you can imagine, it largely had an impact on uh, low income. Their work largely had the impact of disenfranchising elder, uh, low income, uh, people of color, and trans folks. Um, in the work that they did, but, you know, they had elections volunteers who would be stationed at polling places uh, trying to find what they considered to be fraudulent votes. And in their messaging in 2012, for the first time that I've ever heard of, uh, they actually specifically targeted transgender folks uh, with some really offensive messaging uh, and some really offensive cartoon images uh, around uh, this person is fraudulently trying to vote uh, and, and you should stop them because they shouldn't be allowed to commit voter fraud. So I've, I've heard of that circumstance, but it's uh, I don't believe they're a partisan organization. Uh, I think that we can all imagine which way they lean uh, based on who they target for disenfranchisement. Um, but we don't we don't know the answer to that. And there just isn't any data. Even uh, Gallup polls and USA Today polls that try and get exit polling during elections, uh, they've only recently started to ask LGBT questions. In the 90s, they asked some sexual orientation questions, but they've never disaggregated, or at least they've never reported uh, how the numbers look for transgender respondents. So we really just don't know what the voting behaviors of transgender people are, and we don't know who, you know, we, we don't have reliable data on whether there's one party or another that targets trans folks for, for disenfranchisement. All right, we've got two minutes and two more questions. Um, uh, this is a, another one from Gina in Florida, um, and she asks, what happens if someone undergoes FFS and does not look like their ID and photo ID is required? That's a really tough one. Um, 
it, it's a it's a really tough one, and and you know that's going to be the circumstance where uh, we would recommend uh, you know folks first off first and foremost just try and get an updated ID. Uh, you know, in no state, as far as I know, in no state will they require uh, that your photo ID has a gender presentation consistent with the gender marker on the ID. So, you know, when a poll worker is trying to establish whether or not the photo is of the voter, um, that's without regard to the name or the gender marker on the ID. And so, uh, if, a, if a, a voter in your state is unable to access uh, legal name change, unable to access an updated gender marker, they can go to the DMV uh, and just get an updated photo. Uh, and the photo can then look like themselves now, and it'll be it'll be an inconsistent uh, name and gender marker with the way the photo looks, but it'll look like them, and they'll they'll be able to establish that they are the person in the photo. All right, we are at the end of our time actually, and I know we're going to start losing people here, um, so I will just say uh, that we are going to send out the slides um, and all of the materials that were referenced in the presentation to everyone here. Um, my contact information is up on the screen, um, as well as Patrick's, um, and Patrick's really an incredible resource on this uh, going into the election in November. Uh, for folks who had questions we didn't get to, I apologize. Um, if you don't mind emailing Patrick your questions, I think that's probably the best way to follow up. Um, just to wrap up, I want to say thank you so much to Patrick and Kristen, not only for their time today, but also for all of the research.